everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Sussman, Lead Technical Advocate at Sumo Logic. Uh, this session is a deconstruction of AI ops. Here we're going to ask ourselves some questions like, how is machine intelligence applicable to IT operations in the cloud? We will dive into artificial intelligence and address the limitations around data sets and implicit bias that's coded into machines. Then we delve into what this means for IT operations as a whole and the ways that AI-based parsing utilities can essentially help site reliability engineers, you know, operators, developers, security analysts, et cetera, with threat detection. So a little bit about me, um, I'm the lead technical advocate at Sumo Logic. I have about more than 11 years of domain expertise and experience as an engineer, product manager, product marketing manager, all for um, developer tools. Um, I love gardening, reading, playing with Mary Lou, who's on the left, the dog, <laughs> and working on side projects. Some notable side projects I've done in the past include things like running nodes on the Lightning Network, writing smart contracts, running game servers, mostly for fun, uh, building dev kits uh, back when I started out in the hardware world, sewing and woodworking. So now on to talk about the things that everybody wants to talk about. According to this blog post from Sumo Logic on AI versus machine learning versus deep learning, uh, AI systems use detailed algorithms to perform computing tasks much faster and more efficiently than human minds. So this means that AI is an umbrella term that can include machine learning and deep learning, but may also be unable to rationalize or learn from data sets. Popular movies and media often use these terms without clearly defining them, and then this leads to a misunderstanding of the limitations and capabilities of machines that essentially incorporate these categories. Over here, we have a little meme of this guy asking, you know, is this AI? <laughs> With an if-else statement. Okay, so what is general AI? Why, why, why are we talking about why artificial intelligence is kind of dumb? So um, here we see a cute, silly robot from one of my personal favorite shows, Love, Death, and Robots. Uh, this little dude essentially represents what is wrong with general AI in pop culture. Uh, computer scientists usually categorize AI into two categories, general AI and narrow AI. So general AI is basically that Netflix version of this technology, the Isaac Asimov version of machine intelligence that inspired the Foundation series. So you have to think about that and iRobot. So this version is what could become sentient or take over the government, right? Have a robot uprising, get rid of all humans. Uh, another term that's used by computer scientists for this is called GoFi or good old fashioned artificial intelligence. So this is the sort of stuff that the general public gravitates to and has, you know, it, obviously it's the most memorable version, but it's still simply a fantasy. So we often think of AI as a machine that is autonomous or that can interact with other machines dynamically, something that can reason essentially, or even carry out a conversation, but also be able to uh, rationalize things on its own. In reality, even the simplest example of human ability to rationalize and apply logic is quite complex, far beyond the pre-programmed tasks or algorithms that essentially qualify as AI. So narrow AI, the reality of machine intelligence. This slide showcases visual representations of narrow AI, which is real. On the left, we see a corgi, but there's something special about this corgi. So it's a computer generated image from Imagine, a project basically come from within Google. On the right, we see an image sharpening and edge detection uh, example from a white paper I wrote as a product manager at Intel a few years back when I was working on a compiler. I have you know, a poodle, as you saw earlier, and certainly would never sit still, right? He would never sit still for a photo while absolutely enveloped in food. So again, narrow AI is what is real. This is what we actually have. Narrow AI is purely mathematical. It isn't as cool as GoFi, right? Even machine learning, a very cool application of artificial intelligence is really just narrow AI. This is essentially statistics on steroids. So commonly discussed machine learning essentially includes applications such as image recognition, image classification, and detection. Years ago, I was working on that compiler that could essentially aid in sharpening an image and recognize color. These days, uh, machine learning can actually create images that never happened, such as the cute little corgi in the sushi house. So despite the fact that this seems really complex, it's far from you know, the creation of a machine with a soul. 
So moreover, there's a lot of other examples of AI that don't really include a ghost within your machines. There is no consciousness. It's not sentient. Uh, there are also, here we see essentially some image sharpening and edge detection examples, but I would say it's still not quite what we would imagine when we're thinking of that GoFi. Narrow AI is really just a, a model for prediction. It can give you the most likely answer to a question that can be answered with a number. It involves essentially a quantitative prediction. It, again, it's that statistics on steroids, and uh, I have a little bit more on this, on how uh, Meredith Broussard sort of thinks about this. They say that justice is blind, but so is AI. Data sets which power AI can be biased and lead to catastrophic results in the lives of humans. Many examples of this come to mind, including automation around decisions such as loans, college admissions, sentencing, and healthcare. Often these will be biased because we have to think about how the larger data set is going to essentially affect specific groups and minorities who might actually receive you know, the short end of the stick when AI is being implemented. Simply because it's AI does not mean that it doesn't work without the bias of the system. Professor Meredith Broussard, a computer scientist and data journalist, touches upon this idea in her book, Artificial Unintelligence. She discusses the subject of techno-chauvinism, so this is a notion that tech is always the answer, even to mundane problems. It's accompanied by beliefs powered by Ayn Randian meritocracy. So the techno-libertarian idea that computers are somehow more objective or unbiased because they produce algorithms that again are powered by mathematical models. This notion does not aim to address problems in the data set or the data bias in the collection methodology. It assumes we will create a digital utopia due to technological innovation as long as people who use technology are using it correctly. Computers are not necessarily better because they're just equally subjective. They're not necessarily equally objective. They're subjective as the people that create them. And uh, humans essentially test and build the code and the hardware. So they often have a profound misunderstanding of how people will use the technology. The issues that are embedded in AI tend to be overlooked as the logic and data sets are collected for these computations and they sort of come from these homogenous groups, often white men who are producing the code. So let's not forget the mistakes made by naive applications of machine intelligence methods, such as those that essentially create outcomes due to minorities' lower representation in data samples. Fortunately, there is a counterculture effort to disrupt problematic AI authority over people's autonomy. Uh, here we see a good example of techno chauvinism, where we see Elon Musk is wants to kindly donate $100 million toward a carbon capture technology. And we see someone responding with a cheeky response, a tree? <laughs> I mean, you don't really need advanced technology for carbon capture. We've always had it in our ecosystem. So the importance of data privacy and protection. We need to consider the everyday ways that dumb AI governs our lives. It's also near impossible to live our lives without participating in tech giants and subsequently losing track of our own individual data ownership. Fortunately for those in the EU, Article 22 in the 2018 General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, states that AI-driven decision-making regarding the lives of humans is not allowed. So that redlining we we're talking about earlier. The data subject shall have the right not to be subject for a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling, which produces legal effects concerning him or her, similarly significantly affects him or her. We might not fall into the trap of looking for easier, faster, or cheaper automation decision making when it comes to the lives of humans due to the tendency for algorithmic bias. Hopefully, right, this is a step in the right direction as we get more transparency behind the computational logic that is driving that decision making in things like insurance models and item pricing. We should really take out the magical obfuscating elements from terms like artificial intelligence and machine learning and instead sort of lean into better communication for the mechanisms behind those mathematical models and how they impact our lives and our data privacy. Unfortunately, for those of us not in the UK, 
you know, similar data privacy and protection acts don't necessarily apply. But, you know, okay, this sucks. Um, there are some that are popping up, uh, you know, as the general public becomes savvier, you know, things like the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, which proposed several changes uh, to the CCPA, expanding existing data privacy laws for allowing consumers greater control over their personal data and establishing the California Privacy Protection Agency. At Sumo Logic, AI Ops refers to the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and pattern recognition to perform and automate tasks that would normally be executed by IT operations. This means that the mechanisms behind procedurally generated policy lies with the implementation of AI Ops. When many DevOps practitioners think of AI Ops, they think of a closed source black box solution like we talked about before. So an off the shelf sort of algorithm that get, they get essentially no visibility into. Labeling a piece of intellectual property as AI ops essentially obfuscates the complexity of the underlying functionality. And this raises many eyebrows when discussing machine learning in the context of IT operations. As a result, many IT and DevOps practitioners are more comfortable using entirely different terms for describing what might be conventionally called AI ops. I think it's more accurate to describe implementations such as trigger-based response algorithms. They can start subroutines and react based on criteria that humans set up ahead of time. Often, you know, the intelligence the machine provides DevOps practitioners comes from parsing through large data sets and flagging data according to predetermined factors that are set up in the code base. So if you want to learn more about AI ops, um, there's a link to the glossary term page. And if you want to learn more about how Sumo defines the terms, click on that link. So you will also see um, on this particular slide, telescoping relationships between AI, machine learning, and then deep learning. AI ops can basically cover any of these particular levels of machine intelligence uh, in order to help IT managers process and interpret that system data. Key components of AI ops software, aside from just the AI, right? Monitoring the logic behind AI ops can be troubling to IT practitioners and developers who want to understand everything behind how their system operates. They speak the language of bots, daemons, and subroutines and events, right? And you have to think about things like triggers. Perhaps collectively, academics can refer to that as artificial intelligence. However, when companies call these things AI, of course, it implies to these same developers that the solution is not open source. Moreover, the media and TV tend to portray it as something else, as we covered before with GoFi. AI as a term makes things more vague, and so it removes the specificity and essentially serves to obfuscate the interconnected disparate processes that are involved in producing a result. So here we look at the components that we care about the most. Um, monitoring. This is Sumo Logic's bread and butter. All right. Monitoring is used to gather data from disparate sources to look at patterns for analysis and action. At Sumo Logic, we have logs, metrics, and trace analytics to process and analyze massive amounts of data from multiple sources. Correlation. Another term that's used to describe this concept is called grouping. This is when patterns can be found in system data. So for example, anomaly detection can be used in security posture management to find various attack vectors and even use predictive analysis uh, to anticipate known threats. We can correlate things like the time of an incident, affected entities, and connections and infrastructure topology to essentially deliver machine intelligence reports. The reports can help discern probable cause of the incident via anomaly de detection and log summarization, clustering, and dimensional analysis. So correlation helps essentially reduce the noise from a variety of logs coming from disparate sources. And then lastly, analysis, of course. This is the ability to determine problems and root causes. This is where we not only correlate, but also parse through the machine data. And then we produce things like histograms and charts uh, from the metrics and trace data to understand infrastructure topology in a visually based format. The alternative to analysis essentially is a flatter interface like a CLI where all you get could just be uh, a CSV file with the data at the end, or perhaps something within uh, a CLI that is just logs. 
you know, machine parsing allows for better data uh, interpretation and analysis. So here are some key capabilities of AI ops software. So here we have collaboration. One does not simply choose a collaboration tool that allows collaboration. Does the software that you're using help IT teams better collaborate and continue to break down the silos within organizations? Business process automation with human in the loop response allows for faster intervention uh, when you get these incidents. In IT ops, software can come with playbooks and links to dashboards that allow for better monitoring and communication channels, and that reduces incident response times. Informative. Collaboration begets information. Tying in that responsiveness of a system, informative software is important to let security analysts or operations teams know when there is an incident. Even beyond that, enriched machine data can inform what caused the incident, thereby allowing for more in-depth monitoring. Ultimately, this helps reduce not only the mean time to response, but mean time to remediation with human in the loop protocols, you know, to essentially help with problem solving. Responsive. So responding to problems that can occur in the infrastructure or when deploying modern applications is very important. We often talk about reducing mean time to response or MTTR. In our field, we don't really, we, we always think about the ways in which machine intelligence can essentially assist with this. Uh, monitors and known playbooks can allow for auto resolution features. So links to dashboards can also help with quicker diagnosis, but this is further helped by automation, such as like automatic notification via organizational human readable channels, things like email, Slack, Jira, GitHub. Furthermore, known issues and common alerts can be resolved via automation for transient issues, things like spinning up a new Kubernetes instance when resources are scarce. So here is AI ops as an example done right um, through a typical OODA cycle. We talk about this in another talk if you wanted to look into OODA cycles and how essentially Sumo can help with that. So I'm gonna do this really quickly. Um, alert response with an OODA cycle is essentially an idea that came from uh, United States Air Force fighter pilot and Pentagon consultant, Colonel Boyd. So um, according to Boyd, the key to victory is the ability to create situations in which one can make appropriate decisions more quickly than one's opponent. While this was originally developed in air-to-air -air combat, this process easily applies to internet security and was adopted by the Center for Internet Security, or CIS. Taking a templated approach when dealing with app deployments essentially frees development teams to work on the issues that automation can't address. So by building and automating an OODA cycle, DevOps engineers, security analysts, and security engineers are able to speedily pinpoint issues, determine uh, available options, decide on a remediation strategy, and implement it. So this frees up the team to work more on interesting projects and less on the monotonous tasks. So this acronym basically, what does it stand for? Well, it says here, observe, orient, decide, act. So on the bottom, you will see an image of Sumo Logic's Cloud Soar War Room for intelligent security operations. OODA cycles exemplify best practices for security playbooks and incident response cycles in automation. AI-based parsing utilities can help you more quickly identify threats, particularly if you're looking to quickly deal with incident response scenarios late at night or any other inconvenient times. Essentially, you could create scripts to automate uh, incident response processes via webhook connections. So an alert could be raised and your system could send out a ticket with enriched data on said incident. Monitoring logs will essentially help keep track of incidents raised in this sort of watchdog cycle, and then it all begins anew. Best of all, um, logic from these scripts are essentially well understood by the practitioner and their peers, assuming you don't suck at documenting code. AI ops gone wrong. So mathematical pursuits in the field of DevOps are at the core of the logic behind what we call AI ops. As touched upon previously, technical chauvinism is responsible for the idea that AI ops is always the answer but it somehow is a superior magic black box that is outside of the ability for humans to understand. This concept is touched upon in Human Compatible, AI and the Problem of Control by Stuart Russell. So he posits the question of whether the computer is a system of humans 
or if humans have become the tools of the computer system, supplying the information and fixing bugs when necessary, but no longer understanding it in any depth, you know, in terms of how the whole thing is working. He references a computer glitch on April 3rd of 2018 that caused 15,000 flights in Europe to be significantly delayed or canceled, and one in 2010 where a trading algorithm caused the infamous flash crash on the New York Stock Exchange, wiping out $1 trillion and shutting down the exchange. What happened is not well understood or discussed in detail, but this was likely a failure of the AI ops pipeline of logic. If the humans operating the exchange or if the airport terminals understood the underlying operational mechanisms that led to these incidents, adequate response times would have been implemented. Moreover, if humans retain sufficient understanding of the technological systems we use, we will be able to also retain autonomy and artificial intelligence could be an enhancement of our capabilities, not a hindrance. This is why it is important for DevOps engineers, site reliability engineers, uh, you know, all kinds of different managers and security analysts to understand the underlying infrastructure from the data that is collected to the logic used in decision-making processes. If the name Stuart Russell sounds familiar at all to you, it's because he probably wrote the book that you used in university on Intro to AI. Anyway, thank you for joining us. And uh, I'll leave you with another meme. Not sure if AI ops or machine-based parsing utilities and observability slash monitoring software. Hmm. Reach out to sales at sumologic.com and start your free trial.